you know, we, we celebrated pretty hard. And I remember the next day on the Sunday, you know, I was laying in bed and I got a phone call from Longy and you know, I, I said, oh, who's this? And I was Michael Long. I said, nah, it's not. I thought it was one of the boys playing around. I hung up and he's called back. He goes, nah, it's Longy, it's Longy. I need to have a chat to you. And then he, he offered me the, the scholarship and I yeah, knew it was a second chance. We saw system two, I think, last week. Here's the shot for goal from Lovett Murray. And he likes it. Into the James Hurd pocket. I thought he was going to jump the fence for a minute. <laughs> Ten years at Essendon, 145 games. Much love figure. Uh, thanks for joining us, Nathan Lovett Murray. Ah, oh, thanks for having me, mate. The Dreamtime game is a huge occasion on the football calendar and it just seems to get bigger every year. How important is it to you? Yeah, I think um, you know, the dream time, you know, it's probably been one of my big highlights of being involved in the dream time game. And um, I think it's you know, so important because um, it's about that recognition for past Indigenous players, which you know, how it all started. Um, you know, I think Kevin Sheedy come up with the idea and um, you know, got the AFL to support it, to see you know, how many people come to the, to the dream time now, 95,000 people, you know, it's nearly as big as the Anzac Day match and you know, being involved in both. And you know, it's, it's just great to run out there and, and knowing that all your family, you know, your tribes behind you and, and you see them in the crowd. Um, and it's just been great, you know, the AFL and, and both teams, Richmond and Essendon, just the way they've got behind the concept and, and they've really built it up. Do, do you think occasions like this also help, um, I guess, enlighten the non-Indigenous community about Indigenous history and their contribution to football and just Indigenous issues generally beyond the sporting field. Yeah, it's a big part, you know, just that education for non-Indigenous people just to learn about Aboriginal culture and, um, you know, we've got the oldest living culture in the world and um, I've been fortunate enough, I've been able to learn my culture growing up and it's something that I'm probably consistently doing and I love doing is, is teaching other people about my culture and um, I think you know, the acknowledgement of the, of the past play, past Indigenous players and what they've been through and, um, and to where they got the game to now and opportunities that we as um, you know, Indigenous players that were playing the game to have now, it's, it's been because you know, guys like Michael Long and, and Nicky Wimmer that were able to stand up and you know, to cut out a lot of those sort of you know, racist issues that happened in the past and and this is where we are today, you know, a big game like Dreamtime and you know, 95,000 people watching the game. And it's been, uh, I think people sometimes aren't um, fully aware of just how big um, the Indigenous component of AFL football has become. I can remember Michael Long rolling up to this club in 1989 and interviewing him and Indigenous players in the, what well, was still VFL then, were, were still a rarity, but you have a look at the percentage of Indigenous players playing the AFL, it actually greatly exceeds the number of Indigenous people in society, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think it's you know, nearly 10% or something like that in, in AFL playing um, you know, AFL football. And you know, I think Kevin Sheedy you know, was a, a big component of that. You know, he really opened the doors and, and gave Indigenous people opportunities. And you know, I remember the early 90s, you know, watching Essendon and you know, they had uh, Michael Long, Gavin Wanganeen, and then they won that 93 grand final. and, and you know, Wanganeed had won the Brownlow and Longy got Norm Smith and just to see, you know, that, that really put, you know, Indigenous players on the map and yeah. then from that I think it really sort of exploded and, you know, AFL clubs really started looking at Indigenous talent and seeing what they can do on the field and I think for, you know, when you're an ind Indigenous person, you know, football is just, you know, sometimes it can be an escape, you know, to get away from your community. Sometimes you, you grow up in that and you see a lot of the issues back there and, and you want to get out of there and, and sometimes football is, is that only way of getting out and so, for some of us, you just grow up with a football in your hands and, and um, you know, to see the opportunities now for young Indigenous people, you know, there's so many opportunities now to, to get into the AFL and, and you know, really make something of yourself. Now you mentioned family before. Um, you've, you've got some pretty interesting lineage, I guess you call it. You are the great grandson of Sir Douglas Nichols. Now he is a, a towering figure in um, not only football history, but you know Victorian history. Uh, what, what do you know about Sir Douglas? Yeah, I remember probably growing up, I didn't really know too much about him, but it wasn't until um, you know they, they made a statue of him and, and my great grandmother, Lady Gladys Nichols, and that was probably about uh, 12 years ago, um, just behind Parliament House, and then that's when I really learned his story and and learned who he was and you know, his. Um, his story is just remarkable. You know, he come from an Aboriginal mission, Cumbragunja. Um, he, he travelled down to Melbourne when he was about 16, 17, and he went and tried out with the Colton Blues, but unfortunately, um, you know, he got discriminated against. And mm. um, to Colton Blues' credit, they, they, you know, they did an apology last year to the family, which was great. And then I think he went and played at Northcote for a couple of years, and then 
um, got an opportunity with uh, Fitzroy Lions in the VFL and um, I think he played over 50 games and also played for Victoria. But I guess it wasn't until when he finished his football, um, you know, he'd become a pastor and, and his community work that he did around Fitzroy and, and probably around Australia with the Indigenous people, you know, he really got that acknowledgement where he was um, knighted by the Queen, um, pastor, um, governor of South Australia. And, for him to able to overcome you know, some of those issues. So you know, he, he is really an inspiration for a lot of people and it's, it's great that the AFL have acknowledged him um, you know, with the, the round named after him. And um, you know, yeah, it's just a great story for you know, all Australians to learn about. Well, let's talk about your story. You, you grew up playing in Haywood. You played TAC with North Ballarat Rebels and then you were rookied by Collingwood, weren't you? You played a lot of VFL with Williamstown and then switch to the Bendigo Bombers. So tell us how that all happened. Yeah, um, yeah had the opportunity at Collingwood, um, didn't play any senior games, played in the reserves with Williamstown, who was their reserves um, team at the time, and um, ended up getting delisted and, and then chose to stay in, um, in Melbourne and play for Williamstown. And then at the end of that season, um, I decided to go up to Darwin and um, play football up there with a couple of mates. You know, they played in off season and I went and played with St Mary's and yeah. as a lot of people know, that's uh, Michael Long's old former club. And so I played there and played in the grand final. And then I remember after the grand final, um, you know, bumping into Longy and sort of talking to him a bit about um, being a little bit homesick and wanting to go back to Hayward. And, um, and then he, I remember he just told me, you know, just stick at it, you know, opportunities will come, you know, and just make the most of it. And then I remember going back to Hayward and playing the first game of the season with Haywood and Haywood hadn't won a game for about two years and we ended up losing by one point and then the next game we ended up winning and it was like we won a grand final and you know we, we celebrated pretty hard and I remember the next day on the Sunday you know, I was laying in bed and I got a phone call from Longy and you know, I, I said oh who's this and I asked Michael Long I said nah it's not I thought it was one of the boys <laughs> playing around I hung up and he's called back he goes nah it's Longy it's Longy I need to have a chat to you and then you know at that time he um Essendon had the Michael Long scholarship going and so he, he offered me the, the scholarship and I yeah, knew it was a second chance so you know, I pretty much had to move to um, Bendigo straight away. Well, halfway through that season with Bendigo Bombers, Sheeds asked me to, to come move back to Melbourne and, and train with Essendon full time and yeah, they ended up rookieing me so I got put on the rookie list. Yeah, 2004, my first year, I think there was an injury, I got put on the senior list and yeah. you know, played round one and I think we played against Port Adelaide, Port Adelaide over in Adelaide so had all my family, had about three, four carloads from Haywood drive over to come watch me and um, we got flogged by 98 points. I had uh, one kick and two ambles and I think oh, my AFL career's over but at least I played one game and I missed the round two. I got back into the team round three and um, I think I might have, we played against Colton on a Friday night and kicked three goals and you know, I got stayed in the team and ended up playing 21 games that year, played yeah. in the final and you know, it really gave me the confidence that you know, I can play AFL football and I remember that year just running around in the Ford Pocket and MCG with you know, guys like Matthew Lloyd, James Hurd, Mark McCurry, Dean Rioli, you know, Joe Mercedes, um, you know, these guys were legends, you know, legends of the football club. Couldn't believe it, but you know, I, I played a few games and, and got my confidence up and then really started to believe that I, I belonged there and yeah, ended up playing 10 years at the club and um, you know, I was pretty happy with that. I was going to ask you, I mean, so going from a rookie draft and then playing 20 games in your first year, like it's, uh, something must have really clicked for you. Did you surprise yourself? Really? Yeah, I, I did surprise myself, but I, I remember Sheeds, like meeting Sheeds, um, you know, when I got drafted and just him saying, look, this is your second chance, you know, really make the most of it, you know, don't, don't waste your time here. So I remember that advice and just the time, you know, that pre-season, I remember just working so hard and, um, and I just believe that, you know, if I work hard enough, the rewards will come and, and the rewards did come and, and that's what I've always tried to do is, you know, whatever, if you, whatever you put in is, is what you'll get out and, you know, if you work hard, then um, the rewards will come. Directly in front. This is the reward that Das has been talking about and they get at the Bombers. Love it. Murray gets the first for Essendon. You know, often guys can play a number of roles and it's sort of like, you know, we're, oh, we have to put him there. We, you became a bit of a Mr Fixit who could really have an impact and then later on when the substitute came in, you know, you sort of became the shock trooper off the bench. Do, do you, I mean, as a junior, had you played a variety of positions or did that just sort of evolve? Uh, through my junior footy, I, I played a lot in the back line. Also a little bit in the midfield. And so when I first come to Essendon, and I, like I really wanted to play in the midfield, you know, that was what I wanted to do, you know, straight from the start, but I probably had to work on my game, you know, my skill, my fitness. You know, I remember my first year I played in the forward line and kicked 20 odd goals. And then 
after that, I moved to the back line and, and played half-back flank for a good sort of two, three years and then um, finally got into the midfield. And then um, you know, from there, I was able to play utility. I think there was a couple of games I played in the ruck. Um, We're going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, you know, I was just happy to play, you know, wherever the team needed me and, you know, wherever the coaches needed me, so... Well, you brought it up, that uh, famous final 2009 against Adelaide where, uh, interesting lesson and sort of didn't go with the Ruckman and you were the man. How was that? Uh, I think there was a couple of games before that I, I played in the Ruck and I think I might have won a couple of taps and got a you know, few possessions around the ground and might have kicked a goal or two. So I think the, the coach, you know, uh, Knight, Knights at the time, he was... Yeah. Um, you know, pretty sort of happy about that and you know, saw me as another option in the ruck and I remember going in the final I think you know, I think we might have had a couple of injuries and yeah, um, yeah so they, they made that decision and now um, reading a bit of background about you the I guess the pride in your heritage and the um, determination to stick up for your people has always been very strong I, I was reading that you um, you caught quite a bit of flack at school as a kid and and at school it's a, it's a tough Upbringing. Yeah, I think um, you know, like you know, I was, like I was talked about earlier. You know, I, I I grew up in Hayward, a small country town, and um, you know, and was very strong culturally. You know, we, we knew we knew our history. Um, we knew Captain Cook wasn't the first person on this <laughs> that, on this country, and I think it just goes back to that education, <clears throat> um, educating people. Where what I've learnt through my time at Essendon. And, and coming across a lot of non-Indigenous people, you know, they really want to learn about Aboriginal culture and, and probably what they see is, is in the media and, and a lot of the time what's in the media, it's probably negative. So um, just being able to go back on my country and, and, and walk my country and, and learn from my uncles and my elders, um, but now I'm in a position now to, to teach my kids and my nieces and nephews, and but just even the wider community, you know, to, you know, if they want to learn, you know, go and, and talk to local Aboriginal people and. Um, you know, there's so much history and culture here in Victoria. You know, I've, I've got a lot of you know, connection all around Victoria and, and something that um, you know, I'm still learning, and, but something that I'm very proud of and, and happy to, to talk and, and teach people about that um, connection as well. Well, I think your mum was saying that you um, seem to become a lot more political. Um, it's probably around 2006, 2007. It was when the Closing the Gap campaign was going on you made a, a trip to South Africa and saw a different side of race relations and you also um, you know incredibly I, th I think the number was that you attended eight funerals of friends and family within about two months so was that sort of a major a, a real sort of um, moment in your life that sort of made you even more determined to push these causes? Yeah, I think I remember at that time. Um, you now I'd gone to South Africa with the AFL with some with um, some really good people, and um, and also I remember a week before, uh, two weeks before I went to South Africa, I also went on a trip to Mutuchulu, which was an Aboriginal community at the base of Ayers Rock, and you know, I spent some time there. And um, I remember just you know being there, and then also going to South Africa and seeing the same type of po poverty. Um, you know, that Aboriginal people live here in Australia and, you know, we live in a wealthy country and I was asking the question, you know, why, why is that the case? And, um, you know, in the last, I guess, 10 years, I've just been really passionate about um, Indigenous health. Um, Indigenous life expectancy is 20 years below non-Indigenous people and, and, and for that, what that means to me is I'm forever going to funerals after funerals after funerals of family members and, you know, the, the oldest living culture, we shouldn't be living in the poverty that, that I see when I go to these Aboriginal mm. communities or even when I go to my own communities, you know, I, I see it there. And, and what I see is this, that Aboriginal people need to have a voice. We need to have a voice and I feel that um, our people are probably not listened to, mm. um, you know, from the decision makers. Um, and we just need to get better in that area. And, and once we start doing that, then you'll start seeing real changes. And you know, through football, it, it's given me so many great opportunities. It's given me a profile, it's given me a voice. Um, you know, it's, I've, I've been able to travel all around Australia and, and over the world and, and you know, trying to, I guess, look for answers and, and how, can, you know, we can, how can we do things better for you know, Aboriginal people. So with your football, you, you finished up with the Bombers at the end of 2013. Um, what have you done post uh, this club in terms of both playing, coaching, how's that uh, panned out? Yeah, when I um, retired, um, I was lucky that um, I, I continued working with the Long Walk uh, Foundation. So yeah. I think at that time it was a 10 year anniversary. So I was involved um, in putting on a big concert um, for the Long Walk you know, before the Dreamtime Games. Um, at that time, I, I, I was, 
signed up with Rumbalara Football Club and went and played um, football up there in Shepparton. Um, I finished up there with Rumbalara and then I made the decision to move back to Hayward. Um, signed up with Hayward and um, I was playing football there. But then I just I got to sort of halfway through the footy season and you know, I had uh, a bit of an incident with an uncle that sort of lost his life at a football game. You know, he got king hit from behind and you know, he died. So you know, I sort of seen that happen and you know, it sort of impacted me in a way where it sort of made me you know, really want to follow my dream of what I wanted to do next with my life. And at that time, I made the decision that I wanted to coach and, and get into coaching. And um, I knew that if I wanted to do that, I couldn't be in Haywood. So I made the decision to move back to Melbourne and um, I stayed in Melbourne for a few months and I went back to playing with Rumbalara and then an opportunity came up to go and coach and so I relocated to Shepparton and moved up there for a couple of years and um, got a job uh, working at a, an Aboriginal school, um, Ash Academy Sport, Health and Education as a youth worker and I really enjoyed that role um, and I was also a playing coach with Rumbalara and, um, and that was the advice. I remember um, bumping into Kevin Sheedy here and and telling him that you know, I wanted to get into coaching and he said, oh look, you need to go coach your own team and um, you know, learn about coaching that way. And so that, that's why I wanted to go coach my own team in a local footy comp and, you know, and, and had a really great opportunity. I uh, learnt a lot, um, but yeah, finished up the coaching now and now I'm um, relocated uh, back to Inverloch up near Phillip oh, yeah. Island and I'm um, coaching an under 18 Aboriginal team, Laguntas, um, for young guys that miss out on playing TAC Cup. Um, they play about three games during the season against a multicultural team, also a Vic Country team. You know, I coach that, that young group and that's probably where I really want to be um, coaching. You know, young people you know, are really motivated and want to go to that next level because you know, I've, I've played at that elite level for 10 years and I've, I've got a lot to give back and you know, really passionate about trying to get young Indigenous people you know, into that level as well. Well, the Indigenous influence in AFL football continues to grow, but I was just thinking as you were saying that, how big a moment it would be when we got our first Indigenous AFL coach. That would be a great thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, I remember meeting um, with the AFL, you know, probably five, six years ago, and, and that was something that they were really pushing was, mm. you know, to get more Indigenous coaches. And, um, you know, and there's so many you know, great you know, ex Indigenous players that would, would make great coaches and there's probably a couple that are coaching now and one that comes to mind is Xavier Clark and, and he's a really great coach and you know, hopefully he, he's somebody that you know, can really you know, lead the way in that area and it's something that, you know, that, that that's the pathway that I want to sort of go through and um, you know, get to be at an AFL club you know, sort of coaching and I guess passing on my experiences as well. So the Dreamtime game, when you sit down and, and watch it now, obviously there's a lot of pride. I mean, do, do you sort of reflect on your whole AFL career, the, the highs and lows? Do you also at the same time reflect on Indigenous players and Indigenous people in general and what this all means for them? I mean, there must be a lot of emotions go through your, your head besides just preparing to sit there and watch a football match. Yeah, I remember... Um yeah, a couple of years ago, um, going to Dreamtime and <coughs> being a part of the um, on-ground um, ceremony mm. and um, being able to, you know, get painted up and, and, and lap lap and possum skin cloak, you know, my traditional um, dance and, and, you know, that was really sort of felt really powerful and, and being on the MCG and, and doing that traditional dance, you know, with other Aboriginal dancers and, and, I, and you know, last year I remember going to watch the game and just sitting in the crowd, you know, with all the community and, and just how it brings you know, all the people together. And um, you know, I guess in the Aboriginal community, we don't get many sort of positive um, times to, to, to meet up and, and, you know, and, and have a good time. You know, a lot of times we're meeting up for funerals and, and stuff like that. So you know, to be able to have this event you know, for our people to come together and, and you know, just to enjoy football and, and um, you know, just spend time and, and have a laugh, you know, it's just great to be a part of that. Well, it's a, a great thing on the AFL calendar. I think um, it's always a great game. It's always hotly contested. I um, hope you enjoy it as much as it sounds like you enjoy the other ones. And uh, thanks for recalling your time with Essendon Football Club, an eventful time and uh, some great stories. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, mate. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Unfortunately, too much of it to uh, show here, but if you want to hear the full version, there's an audio podcast available on the Essendon Football Club website.